<clears throat> oh, there we go. Yeah, participants climbing. So for those who, who just joined us, we're uh, gonna give folks a few minutes just to, to log in and get settled and start shortly after six. So hold tight. Yeah, we're at six o'clock. Uh, for those who have just tuned in, we're going to give folks another minute or two to join, and then we'll we'll get going. So thanks for joining us. All right, that's uh, 6.02. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll get started. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, we are very thrilled to have so many people in attendance tonight and are looking forward to a great guest speaker. Um, before we get started, I do want to thank the New Canaan Library for allowing us to use their uh, Zoom platform. Um, the, we're in Zoom webinar, which means that you can use the question and answer, answer feature. Uh, so as we're progressing through the presentation, if something comes up, uh, just type your question into that Q&A box. Um, uh, when we get to the end of the sort of the land trust portion of the evening, we'll take some of those questions and pose them back to the presenters. And then we'll do the same at the end of our, uh, our guest lecture by Professor Torres. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to board president, Tom Cronin. Thank you, Aaron. Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome all of our guests, members, our board of directors, and our guest speaker to the 2020 annual meeting of the New Canaan Land Trust. Again, I'm Tom Cronin, and I have the privilege to serve as the current president of the board. Tonight, we will keep the formal part of the meeting rather simple. Our treasurer, Arthur Berry, will present a snapshot of our financial position, followed by our executive director's report. Then Aaron will introduce tonight's guest speaker, Professor Gerald Torres. But first, I'd like to make a few comments. When we last met, our Annual meeting was in the cozy quarters of the carriage barn this same time last year. Things certainly have changed since then. We'd all agree that uh, this has been a year like no other. But despite the challenges, the Land Trust continued to serve its mission 
of fostering a connection between the community and our natural resources through conservation and sustainable stewardship of our open space. In fact, I think we would all agree that we were in a unique position to rise to the challenge that the COVID crisis presented. At the height of the crisis in the spring, you'll recall that out of abundance of caution, we briefly closed our trails, which in retrospect was the right thing to do. But for the better part of the last eight months, land trust properties and trails provided a much needed outlet for residents, a close and safe place to go, a place to find solace and to recenter oneself. We had many new visitors to our properties this past year. Uh, normally our members and our visitors have a favorite property or two that they go to. This summer, our sculpture trail brought our members to multiple properties to view the fusion of art and nature. And our virtual events continue to keep the community engaged with our work. Very importantly, this past year, we also completed our strategic conservation plan. As land and water conservation remain at the forefront of what we do at the New Canaan Land Trust. The plan looks forward over the next 20 years and includes the goal of preserving an additional 400 acres of open space in our community. And during the year, while the COVID crisis initially challenged our efforts to meet and actively recruit volunteers, we still managed to keep up with our perpetual responsibility for care of our land that we protect. So we have started this new fiscal year very healthy and strong and prepared to continue our promise to serve our community. We will expand our partnerships this coming year like those we've had with the New Canaan Library and the Carriage Barn Arts Center. And we intend to grow our staff with the addition of a TerraCorp service member that we will recruit this coming spring. And finally, we will continue to strengthen our financial position to ensure our sustainability and our growth. So to tell you a little bit more about that, I'd like to now hand it over to Arthur Berry to provide our treasurer's report. Thank you. Art? Good. Um, I'm delighted to uh, be on with you all as, as well. And would like to start for the uh, start the um, uh, my part with the talking about membership growth over the last uh, eight years. As you can see from the slide, we've gone from 115 members to 117 uh, in the early part of this decade to last year's uh, number of 427 families. Um, this is an 11% increase over the prior fiscal year. And our goal for this year coming up is uh, 450 families. It's interesting to note that when uh, the New Canaan Land Trust started some 53 years ago, we had about uh, 600 me members within uh, the end of two years. Uh, you're probably all somewhat interested in the uh, expenses and uh, revenues, and that uh, is shown on the next slide. Uh, we went up in all of our categories to a total of $366,000 in revenues and uh, about $258,000 in uh, expenses. There was about $65,000 uh, realized in revenue that was delayed or restricted and not to be used until the year that we're in now. Uh, this is normal because we're on a fiscal year that ends May 31st. And, um, you know, there are, are things that go on in the summer and the fall that people are willing to uh, help fund uh, uh, prior to uh, uh, May 31st. So even, even if you took that 65 out, because our accountants make us uh, uh, realize it when it comes in, obviously, um, 
we still had a gain of over $40,000 over our expenses. And you should also know that um, the majority of the revenue is from donations, uh, uh, basically from the membership or friends of the land trust. And a number of people have contributed for a, a significant number of consecutive years. Um, and we had some special things that we did last year with this money, including uh, signage uh, on the properties that we've opened up in the last uh, seven years or so. And uh, the sculpture trail and many plantings where we're trying to restore uh, native plant areas. There's only about 20% of our expenses are related to fund fundraising and uh, administration. 80% goes toward uh, supporting our programs. Um, in terms of our financial position, uh, you can see that we're in the, the best shape we've uh, ever been in, or at least in the last uh, eight years by far. Um, the, the categories that you might have questions are about are, are the investments, which basically consist of very short term uh, CDs uh, with the bank. Uh, the New Canaan Community Foundation funds are funds which uh, we have entrusted them with uh, for a longer term investment and also as a reserve in case of uh, needing money to uh, work on properties in the case of a major storm. Um, and on the accounts payable side, you see we do have a, a PPP loan, uh, modest, and we expect to uh, uh, have that be fully forgiven once our bank starts uh, processing uh, forgiveness applications. Uh, the only other thing I'd mention is that we do have <laughs> There is something in the other category uh, on the asset side, which includes a truck that uh, uh, we were grateful to have uh, purchased la last year. So I think that uh, about wraps it up for me. This does not include uh, any of the land. The land comes in at uh, whatever it's valued at uh, currently, and, and that uh, valuation has never changed. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Aaron, who will talk about uh, what's been going on for the last uh, year. Thank you, Art. And thanks again for everybody who's tuning in tonight. Um, I'm going to start with a short overview of our past year, um, talking about some of the things that we've accomplished together with your support. Uh, it's been a crazy year, and it's worth noting that much of our work happened prior to the pandemic. Uh, as Art mentioned, our, our fiscal year starts June 1st. So a fair amount of our last year was actually pre-COVID. So I'll be talking about some of our more traditional work that we did pre-COVID, as well as some of the ways that we've transitioned during the pandemic to continue serving the New Canaan community. And so the question I'm gonna pose is the same one that I posed uh, at the annual meeting last year, which is how are we helping to create a better New Canaan? And when I say we, I'm talking about, again, the collective we, that's everybody who's tuned into the webinar uh, because by supporting us or by volunteering with us or coming to our programs, you're part of our success. Um, the, the first thing I'm going to start with here is our, our uh, programs that work towards connecting our community with nature and with one another. Uh, we're really heavily focused on building a connection between people and nature, but also using nature as a way to build community and to build relationships. And we want to ensure that people of all ages and all backgrounds have the opportunity to connect with nature. So some of the ways that we did that was through some of our guided walks. These included winter tree ID walks, native species walks, uh, walks focused on pollinators and other um, sort of uh, niche plants and things like that. And we also led a number of sort of community group walks. So ones that weren't necessarily broadcast and open to the public, but that targeted or, or worked with a specific group in town. And so we were fortunate to lead walks with uh, the National Charity League, uh, with the gardeners, and all that as a way for us to introduce them to the land trust and to get them out on our preserves and continue sort of connecting people with these amazing properties that we have around town. Another way that we're uh, connecting folks with nature is through our scout projects. Um, believe it or not, last year was a banner year for scout projects. We had about a dozen uh, boy and girl scout 
uh, candidates work with us on their way towards Eagle Scout or to uh, the Gold Star Award. And the works, the, the projects that they completed included everything from walkways to building kiosks at the trailheads, um, building a few new trails, installing birdhouses and bat houses to create habitats on our properties. Um, and really it's just a, a whole host of other things that have improved our properties, both for our visitors as well as for the, the animals that reside there. Uh, we held our first ever New Canaan Dog Day, which unfortunately we couldn't do again this year due to, due to the pandemic, um, but it was a fun way to get our families out, uh, families with dogs out to our property and to sort of showcase our, our dog friendly preserve. Um, many of you probably joined us for uh, an incredible lecture by the renowned author Doug Tallamy. Um, he presented um, his new book called Nature's Best Hope and a, a new presentation from based on that book. Uh, again, that was a, a collaborative event with our Pollinator Pathway partners. So again, a thanks to the library as well as all of the other partners like the Garden Club and the Beautification League and Nature Center, um, all that have sort of environmental missions and are working towards this, this native plant vision for our community. We also had many more community events, including volunteer plantings, uh, our campfire at the Silvermont Fowler Preserve, which again, I'm, I'm sad to say is one of those events that isn't going to make it this year, but we'll be sure to bring it back as soon as it's safe to do so. And in addition to our community engagement events, we do have sometimes a, a special focus on youth in our community and working to instill a, a conservation and a land stewardship ethic um, with the youth in our community. And sort of the flagship way that we do that is through our summer steward program. This is the seventh year that we've been running the program, if you can believe it. Uh, this year, again, we engaged 10 interns in the program and we were incredibly fortunate. This was one of the programs we were able to run during the pandemic. Because our interns were outdoors, they could remain socially distant while they were working on projects um, and whatnot, they put their masks on, as you can see there. So uh, we were really fortunate to be able to run that and it was another great summer. The interns learned about the environment, uh, they completed projects that gave back to the community and helped to build an appreciation and understanding for nature and the environment. Uh, they built new trails, worked on stone walls, removed invasive species, tended to our meadows, watered the new plantings at some of our meadows. Uh, it was an incredibly productive group this year um, and I had to kind of keep coming up with projects for them because they kept running through my list so quickly. Um, so it was great to work with them, but also to sort of see them gain a deeper understanding uh, for the importance of conservation and land stewardship work during their time with the Land Trust. <clears throat> we also had a, uh, a first year college internship program. And so this was sort of a, a result of the pandemic. We, we saw that there were numerous college students in our community that had their plans sort of completely upended by the, the pandemic. And we wanted to be able to create some sort of summer opportunity for them because we have work that we can do outside and on our preserves. And so thanks to funds that were raised during the summer sculpture soiree earlier in the spring, as well as the generous support from the New Canaan Community, Fo Community Foundation and the Jenny M Foundation, uh, we were able to create three new internships with the Land Trust. And again, those gave students whose summer plans had been upended um, really an opportunity to continue on with uh, their, their environmental studies that they may be working on in school, um, and have a rewarding summer experience with the Land, the land Trust. Our, uh, our first intern was Avery York. She was a Silver Mine native and is pursuing a Bachelor's of Art in Environmental Studies at Wake Forest. And she had previously interned with the New Canaan Historical Society, so she was a, a perfect fit for the position that we were looking to create. And so during her time with the Land Trust, she worked to catalog and digitize about 50 years worth of photographs and newspaper articles, so no, no small feat. Um, and she also collaborated with the New Canaan Historical Society to research the history of some of our larger preserves dating back to pre-colonial times to learn a bit about how indigenous peoples used our lands um, or the lands that we're, we're on today, um, as well as sort of some of the early settlers how they used the properties as well. Our second intern was Nick Wyckoff. Um, he was actually a former summer steward intern. So he's had experience with us both as a high school intern and as a college intern. Uh, he's currently at the College of Worcester where he's pursuing a bachelor's in environmental studies. And his job was essentially to, to keep the properties looking good this summer, which was uh, even more important because we had more and more folks using the properties. And uh, we really wanted to ensure that our trails were mowed and looking good. And Nick was out there with the weed whacker and tending to our properties um, pretty much every week. And then lastly, but not least, we have uh, Eliza, who's actually here with us this evening. Uh, she's attending Colby College, where she's pursuing a bachelor's in environmental policy in Spanish, 
and we'll say a few words about her time with the Land Trust now. Thank you, Aaron. Hi, everyone. Um, like Aaron mentioned, my name is Eliza Poli, and I am a junior up at Colby College in Waterville, Maine, where I'm double majoring in environmental policy and Spanish. Um, this past summer, I was going to be working at a wilderness tripping camp up in Maine as well, um, where I had worked the previous two summers and I attended for a number of summers as a camper. Um, but obviously, given the pandemic, just like pretty much every other summer camp um, across the country. Uh, it was deemed that it was too unsafe. Um, and so I found myself home for the summer. While I couldn't be up in Maine, uh, I was really excited for the opportunity to work uh, with the land trust and explore a career in the field of um, the environment and environmental studies. I was unsure and quite honestly still am unsure about where my career path might take me in the future. Um, especially given how the environmental field is rapidly and constantly changing, but I was excited to gain work experience through the land trust this summer. Um, as the steward intern, I conducted property inspections on many of the 65 properties owned and maintained by the New Canaan Land Trust, and I was also able to help out with the high school summer internship program that Aaron mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, which included overseeing the high schoolers and helping to complete tasks such as storm cleanup from that <laughs> crazy storm we had um, and fence construction as well. I learned a lot about the land trust from Aaron, including the programming it runs throughout the year, um, how properties are acquired and maintained and how we work with local organizations and individuals to expand and protect the properties that we already own. Um, I just wanna close by saying thank you to Aaron and the donors who made this summer experience possible. And I'm excited to watch the Land Trust continue to grow in the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eliza. And thanks for taking time out of uh, what's probably a busy time of your college semester to, to join us this evening. Um, so moving forward in a, in a year like no other, we had to think outside of the box and that included developing new ways to engage our community. And so our college internship program was one example of how we did that, but we also found other ways to serve and engage our community. Uh, the first was the New Canaan Sculpture Trail. And we are incredibly proud of this partnership. Uh, it was made possible by our partnership with the Carriage Barn Arts Center, as well as our generous sponsors, the Anderson Family Foundation, the Stuart Higley Foundation, AP Construction, and the town of New Canaan. And we think the, land, or the uh, sculpture trail was an enormous success. Um, and we have numbers to back that up. Uh, some of you who visited the sculptures may have noticed that each sculpture had a little trail camera positioned on it. And that was so that we could track visitation. And I'm proud to say that we had literally thousands and thousands of visitors to the sculpture trail. Uh, we don't have an exact tally yet because we're just pulling some of those cameras and have hundreds of gigabytes of photos to go through. Um, but we're, we're pretty confident that we'll get close to, if not surpass, a 10,000 mark. And so an incredible way to bring new visitors to New Canaan to experience the beauty of our town and also provide a way for our residents to engage with um, the, the land trust properties in a different way. And overall, I think it was just an incredible way to, to elevate the land trust's presence in the community and showcase some of the amazing places that we've protected around town. Um, in the, the last couple of months, we've also added two new walking trails to our, uh, our network of open space. We have a new Green Link Trail, which we opened on Owen Oak Lane, which was made possible by an incredible donation from Larry Berger and Anouk Markovitz. Um, there's also a new sort of connector trail at the Still Pond Preserve, which enables a more, more of a loop walk than an out and back. Um, and all of this ties back to our ongoing work to expand walking trails and sort of create a, a connective tissue in New Canaan where folks can, can get from one place to another by walking, maybe rather than taking a car, and also just providing more opportunities for folks to get out, find solace, refresh, relax, whatever it may be. Another part of our mission, as Tom mentioned at the beginning, is taking care of our network of open space and land stewardship remains a focus of the land trust. Um, this includes everything from maintaining habitats in our meadows. Uh, we do our annual mowing. We've been adding new plantings to some of our meadows to increase the diversity there. Um, we help to maintain these rare and, and really important habitats. I, I always talk to folks, uh, or I always tell folks when I'm talking about meadows, if you look at sort of a, a Google map or a Google Earth image of New Canaan, you see a lot of trees, but you don't really see a lot of meadow and this early successional habitat is, is really important for, um, for the, the animals that live there and the pollinators and bees and butterflies. So working to maintain those meadows is, is one of the ways that we're stewarding land. Uh, we're also continuing to restore some of our town's historic stone walls. 
um, our interns uh, got about two thirds of the way through restoring the Hicks stone wall that's on Silver Mine Road near Pastures Lane. Um, and we're hoping with a few more volunteer days, we'll be able to wrap that up maybe even by the end of the year. Um, you all might have noticed uh, one of the, the our newest projects completed, and that's the installation of a number of welcome signs across our, our properties. So we've installed nine signs that are open to the public preserves. Um, and this was a project made possible by our, uh, a number of generous sponsors, including Art Berry, uh, the Poblasek family, the Sapansky family, the Shipper family, the Sturgis family, uh, Brown Thayer and Shed Insurance, the Stuart Higley Foundation, and KCL Capital. And so these are just another way of introducing visitors to our properties, making it easier to find these places where folks can get out and recreate um, and, and sort of showcasing all that the New Canaan Land Trust has accomplished over the last 50 years. We're also working to remove invasive species and restore native habitats through planting. Uh, these are some photos of our, our newly established Fowler Meadow, which was installed right about this time last year um, and has since bloomed into an incredible uh, habitat there at the Silver Mine Fowler Preserve. And our woodlands, we're also working to remove invasive species um, and, and uh, take care of our properties. Uh, we're also standing up for nature when it's threatened. And so together with the Norwalk River Watershed Association, uh, we intervened in a process uh, that would have allowed the Norwalk First Taxing District to build nearly 1500 feet of bank or uh, of walls along the banks of the Groups Reservoir, which is part of the Silver Mine, Fowl or the Silver Mine River. Um, we are currently done with the hearing process. We're preparing the briefings. And so we'll be sure to let you know what comes of this. We're sort of in a waiting phase right now. Um, but if there are ways to get involved, we'll be sure to let you know. We're also working to strategically expand our, our network of open space. And this is really the, the core of what we do is land conservation. And so as Tom mentioned earlier, uh, this year we created our first ever strategic conservation plan. And the first part of that plan was for us to sort of take a step back and say, what are we really interested or, or focus, want to focus on protecting? And we identified four main uh, protection priorities. And those are the ones you see here, um, protecting healthy habitats, creating new opportunities for recreation, protecting water resources, especially since water is such a critical resource for those who are on wells, which is about half the town. Um, and then sort of expanding our, our reach a little bit and thinking about how we can conserve historic and culturally important resources. And so as part of this plan, we created a uh, pretty sophisticated model. We took a number of data sets that included everything from climate resilience to bird migration patterns to water quality and sort of assigned points to those and churned out this, uh, this final ranking system. And so the map on the right, areas in dark green are areas of incredibly high conservation value. And those are where we're gonna be focusing our conservation work um, in the coming years. The plan identifies a number of, uh, of parcels that are sort of prime for protection. Uh, almost a thousand acres identified in this plan, which gives us a lot of land to work with and work towards achieving uh, what is a pretty ambitious goal. Um, I call it our big, hairy, audacious goal. That's actually a term coined by um, a consultant named uh, Jim Collins. And the idea is it's a, it's a moonshot and that if, it real, if you realize that um, idea, it could have a really significant uh, impact on the organization or the community that they're serving. And so our big, hairy, audacious goal or BHAG um, is to preserve 400 additional acres um, by 2040. And so that would double the amount of land that we've protected and also double the rate at which we're protecting that land. And so all of this ties back to sort of why we do what we do. And I think this story here is a perfect illustration of sort of the land trusts work and how it impacts our community. Um, this is uh, Creighton. Um, he lives next to the Silvermine Fowler Preserve. If you've been out there, you've probably seen him because he's out there playing almost every day. And so these open spaces are really uh, a way for us to provide an opportunity for folks to, to connect with nature and experience with nature. But I think we're also starting to go a step further now with these programs and outreach that we've been doing and, and instilling this sort of conservation ethic. And so the photo on the right is Creighton on Earth Day. Um, he, he learned that it was Earth Day and wanted to do his part to give back. So he took his little battery powered truck and loaded up with uh, as much litter as he could find on the preserve um, and collected about 20 pieces of litter, cleaning up the woods. And this is just one example of sort of how we're, we're not only connecting people with place, but we're also instilling this conservation and this stewardship ethic. And that's that's probably a term that Creighton has no idea what it is, but he embodies it perfectly. So 
Um, I thought this was just a really nice story to, to wrap things up. And so whoop, wrong way. with that, um, I'd like to say thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, again, you can type that into the, the chat window. Uh, we've got a few minutes and then we'll get started with uh, Professor Torres's talk. Uh, how do I see the questions? <laughs> huh. I might have to leave the screen for a minute. Let's see what we've got here. Oh, huh? no questions. All right, well, if, if there are no questions, we are going to give folks a few more minutes to join us. Um, I know some folks might be tuning in right around 630 if they wanted to skip the business portion. Uh, completely understandable. Um, so I am going to put the screen back up. Oh, one cue in the chat. Let's see. How do you plan to get 400 more acres? That's a good question. Um, the, the plan identifies a number of uh, undeveloped parcels. Um, let me see, I'll just go back to the screen here. Um, share. So uh, does this break it out? Yeah, so, so some of the acreage is um, undeveloped land. Uh, some of it is water company land, which we might not um, actually um, own. Uh, sorry, I'm just gonna make this full screen. Um, yeah, so it might, we're not, we, we might not end up owning that land, but we can work with the water companies to ensure that that land is permanently protected um, and that they don't decide that they don't need it anymore and sell it off and then that land becomes developed. Um, there's also the sort of question of the logistics of how we do it. And our strategic conservation plan lays out a number of sort of strategies and benchmarks, including setting aside reserve funds so that when some of these um, pieces of land become available, we can protect them. Uh, another strategy is for us to continually advocate for the town to add funds to the existing land acquisition fund so that should something like a water company parcel that's of significant size and interest to the town become available, together we sort of have the resources to work together um, and ensure that that's protected. And so all of this, this is all sort of laid out in the plan, which is accessible on our website. Uh, I think it's just land trust, you can land trust.org slash open space, but it's also in the menu. So um, let's see. With that, I guess we're at, uh, what time is it? Sorry, a lot of multitasking here, 631. So yeah, I'll be happy to answer any more questions once I kind of get out of full screen and can see them and I'll address those at the end of the presentation. But now that we are right around a little after 6.30, I think we'll introduce our guest speaker. Uh, we are so fortunate to be joined tonight by Gerald Torres. Uh, Gerald Torres is a professor of environmental justice at the Yale School of the Environment and a professor at Yale Law School. He's a former president of the, American, or of the Association of American Law Schools and has taught at Stanford and Harvard Law Schools. Professor Torres serves as counsel to the Attorney General on Environmental Matters and Indian Affairs at the US Department of Justice. He served on the board of the Environmental Law Institute, the EPA's National Environmental Justice Advocacy Council, and was the founding chairman of the Advan Advan Advancement Project. He's the board chair of Earth Day Network and a trustee of the National Resource Defense Council. He was a consultant to the UN on environmental matters. He's a life member of the American Law Institute and the Council of Foreign Relations. So with that, I'm gonna close my screen and allow Professor Torres to come to the screen. And again, just wanna mention that you should feel free to type your questions in using the Q&A feature. At the end of the session, I'll sort of moderate a Q&A session where I can pose your questions to Professor Torres. So with that, uh, without further ado, thank you, Professor Torres. Well, thank you, uh, Aaron, for having me. I wanted, uh thank everyone for for inviting me to, to speak with you um, you know i thought about having a lot of powerpoint slides and, and but i'm terrible at that you know so it's a uh, i i think I'm, I'm one generation too late to be completely uh, uh, uh technologically uh, uh proficient i also want to warn you that my zoom or my internet got a little flaky in my class earlier this afternoon and so I, I hope I hope it was a, a one-time glitch, but we'll see. Um, what I wanted to do today uh, is to is to talk about environmental justice uh, and what it is, but I want to talk about it primarily within the context of what you guys do, because the uh, while you probably don't think of what you're doing uh, as being uh, part of the effort to promote 
uh, environmental justice. Uh, to the extent that you are saving space, land, uh, reducing uh, heat effects of, of the built environment and various other things, you actually are contributing uh, in really important ways. And I'll, I'll talk about that for a minute. So let me uh, spend a little bit of time talking about environmental justice um, and, and then uh, talk about uh, what you do and its relationship to, to environmental justice. Um, the, the environmental justice movement in many ways is tied, uh, at least in, the, in the, uh, um, the, the common version of it, uh, is tied to the uh, 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 United Church of Christ study of hazardous waste sites. Uh, and what the study concluded is that uh, hazardous waste sites were predominantly located in poor and African-American communities. Uh, further studies refined that and uh, determined that race was in fact the, uh, the uh, one factor that outweighed uh, all of the others. So for the early years uh, of uh, the environmental justice movement, uh, the, the interest or the, the writing and the thought and the advocacy centered around uh, permitting and placement of, uh, of various uh, uh, things that would deleteriously impact the environment, waste sites, some manufacturing uh, uh, sites, et cetera. Uh, one of the things uh, I was, uh, I, I wanna correct the, the introduction a little bit. I, I'm actually not at the Department of Justice. I, I was uh, uh, counsel to the attorney general uh, in, in the Clinton administration. Um, and one of the things that I had the, uh, the obligation to do while I was there was to uh, help uh, draft in, uh, the executive order on environmental justice that, uh, that President Clinton signed. Now the executive order was de designed to do a couple of things. What it uh, was aimed at was improving decision-making in the federal agencies so that agencies would take issues of environmental justice into account. Um, we constructed a couple of things that were, uh, we found to be uh, needed and turned out to be useful. And, and those were primarily um, the uh, demographic criteria that would be used to identify environmental justice communities, to uh, get agencies to focus on uh, cross-media contamination, cross-media pollution, uh, and cumulative effects. Uh, and then we, they were uh, uh, required to, to create a, um, a strategic plan to integrate uh, environmental justice in their permitting and decision-making process. The theory behind the executive order was pretty plain. It was tied in many ways to the uh, model that was produced in the National Environmental Policy Act. And what that is, was basically that rather than telling people how to do stuff, you uh, uh, ask them to consider a range of factors or a range of concerns that they had previously not considered. And so you improve the overall decision-making. Uh, now, when, the, uh, when NEPA was originally passed back in 1970, there were a lot of critics who said, you know, there's no substantive law here. Uh, it's not going to produce any good environmental uh, benefits. It's just a, a, a waste of time. And, and it, it makes people feel good, feeling like they've done something, but it's not going to have an effect. Turns out that's not true. Turns out that, that uh, uh, subsequent reviews of the act, and I did one back in the 90s, uh, subsequent reviews of the act uh, indicate that, in fact, environmental, environmentally aware decision making was improved. And so that agencies, by and large, continued uh, with their basic uh, uh, task, whatever their, the legislative charge was, but they executed their tasks, taking into account the ways in which they could reduce environmental impact. So the, the change in what people think about actually changed the process of decision making and improved uh, the decisions. The executive order basically took the same model. What we would do is we would ask uh, people to take into account the impact um, uh, on environmental justice communities 
and through that um, produce decisions that took those social impacts into account. If you look at the literature, you discover that, that, that uh, um, the idea of, of throughput planning uh, is uh, emerging as a way to regulate pollution. Uh, and one of the things that the executive order was designed to do was to put social uh, um, Im impacts in the throughput analysis so that uh, the social consequences of a particular action might be, uh, might be taken into account uh, and, and dealt with before the problem existed. Uh, there's an additional uh, thing that I, I want to point to though, is despite the, the early focus on uh, the placement of unwanted uses, uh, what I wanted to do uh, and what I've tried to do, certainly in the things that I've, I've written, is besides just improving decision making, is to expand the the ambit of what uh, ought to be considered uh, in uh, the uh, idea of having a, a more just world as reflected through not just the prevention of en environmental hazards, but through the distribution of in environmental uh, amenities. And by saying amenities, I want to be clear that I, they, I that they're not just extras or pluses, but they're they're things that actually contribute to our well-being. And this is where the the land trust comes in. You know, one of the things I've been looking at recently, uh, largely because of the impact of of uh, climate disruption and the uh, the uh, effects of, of that on. Uh, on, on human life, especially urban life. Uh, but one of the things I've been exploring is the uh, importance of maintaining both uh, plant diversity and increasing the amount of access to green space or renewing green space where it hadn't existed. So the, uh, the idea of preserving land is actually consistent with the, uh, with the goals in my view of what the environmental justice is uh, uh, movement is designed to do, and let me let me tell you how. The first thing, when you look at the literature that that comes out, is the relationship between uh, the presence of green space and the access to green space on overall well-being. So that the uh, the uh, literature suggests that where there's access to woods, where there's access to uh, trees, where there's access to, to, to a parkland, that certain uh, health conditions uh, are, are improved. The one that uh, is most commonly studied uh, is impact stress. So that, that having access to open space actually reduces uh, the stress uh, that, that people feel. It also has a, a relationship, or at least there's the preliminary studies, show that it has a, a, a relationship to the body composition. That is the, your, your body uh, mass index. B but uh, those are the kinds of things that you would expect, right? All of us who, who like going in the woods, uh, I think intuitively know that it, it's, a, uh, it's a, a bomb for the soul in many ways, I guess I, I'd say. And so that it, it, it reduces tension. That, that little story of the, the, the child who plays uh, in the reserve every day. I mean, th he is, uh, uh, my bed is, will be grow, grow up to be a committed in, in environmentalist. One of the things we do at Earth Day uh, Network is uh, support uh, tree planting initiatives around, around the world. Uh, we have an initiative to plant a, a billion trees. Um, largely to, to reforest places that have been deforested, but also to create access to, uh, to woodlands, to uh, uh, green spaces where people can, can renew themselves. So let me talk about the additional consequences of preserving green space. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you have have college age children or people in high kids in high school or kids in school. But one of the things that, that uh, has uh, been uncovered is that access to green space, uh, 
regular uh, um, visits to, to, to forest land and woods actually improves cognitive ability. Uh, it makes kids better learners. It, and maybe it's just by reducing stress, but certainly the uh, tests, the experiments, which are based around testing, show that, that the uh, access to green space uh, improves the job that schools do. So if you think about this in the, in the context of environmental justice, it makes sense that what you would want to do is to increase access to those kinds of things like parkland, like green space, that would improve the uh, outcomes, the, the academic outcomes, the cognitive outcomes of students, and in fact, in fact, would contribute to another substantial investment that we make, which is in schools. So it would make schools uh, uh, more effective. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a connection that, uh, that has not been a widely, uh, widely studied, but the, 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 the uh, material that I've looked at suggests that this is true. And, and even if it's just slightly true, even if it's, if, if it's not a dramatic uh, improvement, it seems to me it's something that we ought to uh, focus on because it, it not only improves uh, uh, overall health outcomes, but improves cognitive uh, outcomes. One additional way that it helps uh, improve cognitive outcomes is by the effect it has on uh, reduction of, of heat. So one of the problems with climate disruption is the, the uh, change in, in temperature so that you know, who knows if the crazy storm we had this, this, uh, this uh, summer was related to, uh, to um, a climate disruption. All I know is I had to chop up three trees that uh, were knocked down on my property. And uh, I wish I had a chainsaw, let me just say. Uh, but the, uh, the reduction of heat has been shown, or the, um, um, not just reduction of heat, but the overall lowering of, of the, the heat profile uh, has uh, an effect on, on health in, uh, uh, in important ways, but it also has an effect on the ability to learn. One way to, 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 uh, to, to view this is the relationship between the relative, uh, relative heat. So places that have uh, a lot of tree cover compared to you know, cities which have less tree cover, tend to be up to eight degrees cooler on average over the course of the year. It, it may not seem like a lot, but it's, it's enough to have uh, a measurable, measurable impacts on uh, how kids, how kids do, in, do in school. So those are, those are some uh, effects that, that go to things like stress, which are the, then related to uh, uh, reduction of heart uh, disease, uh, and other stress-related illnesses. But there's another benefit. Uh, and maybe when we finally get to all electric cars, uh, it, it won't matter quite as much. But, but the studies indicate that where you have significant uh, green cover, you also reduce the incidence of, uh, of uh, asthma. So that if you reduce the, uh, the inc incidence of asthma, you then increase the overall well-being of uh, children, and you again make them uh, uh, sounder, uh, uh, sounder citizens. Um, the 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 uh, um, one of the studies that 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 uh, I looked at even attributes increased green space and access to green space to longevity. So who knows if all of the factors have been uh, controlled uh, for? Of course, it's a multivariate uh, uh, analysis you would have to have to do. But at least one study suggested that that uh, longevity is tied to uh, to doing what you all are doing, which is preserving space and making making it uh, available uh, to uh, to uh, to people. Now. It's not just the, the, the canopy or the, the woods. One of the studies I looked at actually indicates that the, uh, uh, the natural views, so the change in natural views, so the places where you can actually see uh, things, and, and this is where the 
uh, meadows actually come in uh, because the meadows increase the, the, uh, the, the visual sight lines. But natural views um, can reduce and access to natural views and multiple natural views actually have shown to uh, reduce uh, attention deficit disorder. So that, that, that the, when you start looking at the epidemiological studies, uh, uh, when you start looking at the studies that, that public health uh, people have, uh, have done, what you discover is there is almost no downside to preserving uh, uh, open space. And so why am I suggesting that it's, it contributes to, to climate, uh, to um, environmental justice? Two reasons. One, having uh, public access uh, means that it's, it's uh, available to, to the public, right? So that, that this good that you're providing is not just a, uh, something that contributes to the, the beauty uh, of the community, but in fact contributes to the overall well-being of the community, well, not just to the people who are active participants uh, in, in creating it, although I suspect, uh, uh, I haven't seen any studies on that, but I suspect that uh, uh, participating in the process of building these spaces out is actually a, a vivifying uh, endeavor. But it contributes to the overall well-being by increasing the uh, access to those things that benefit public health. And my view uh, about uh, environmental justice is that the uh, reduction of the uh, 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 sources of uh, stress that produce the negative impacts on human health is a, uh, a good. Okay, what else? What else does open space do? Well, you know, the, the, besides the things like reduction of, of asthma, and how does it, what's the mechanism of that? The mechanism of that is uh, the uh, capturing of particulate matter. Uh, and so taking particulate matter out of the air. So the, the kinds of things that actually call, cause insults to, to the lungs uh, are, are removed by having tree cover and, and green space, not just trees, but, but, but uh, uh, green space so that it, it actually is acting like a, a filter in a real, uh, in concrete way. The change of views, the, the view lines, the sight lines contribute to reduction in uh, uh, attention deficit dis disorder. It also has an effect uh, or a beneficial impact on pregnancy outcomes. So that in fact, the overall benefits are not just good for, for uh, the, the people who are there, but the, the you know, if, if, if you are pregnant and have access to these spaces, actually, uh, the, the studies actually show that it, it increases the positive outcomes uh, related uh, uh, to, to pregnancy. So that, that virtually any way you cut it, and I, I know this uh, betrays my own uh, commitment, but any way you cut it, making access to green spaces, preserving places where people can experience nature firsthand uh, will overall produce positive benefits. Let me uh, shift tax for a, a little bit because uh, here I've, I've been talking up to this point about uh, kind of positive health benefits and the way in which access to green spaces can actually benefit you physically. Uh, I, I'm gonna suggest, uh, and this is the research that comes out of kind of, uh, I didn't even realize it was a field, it sounds a little funny, but leisure studies. If you, if you uh, look at the literature in leisure studies, what you discover is that a popular commitment to doing things like the land trust is doing, which is preserving open space, making it available to members of the community, uh, creating spaces that have a, uh, 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 a common uh, ownership, actually improves uh, civic participation as well. It makes you, it, it constitutes a, a community building uh, process. 
so that 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 communities that have more parks actually have more places where communities can be constructed, where citizenship can be constructed. Uh, and so it not only has a positive uh, um, physical benefits, it has positive social benefits too. And where you have diverse communities, one of the things you need are places where communities can be constructed, communities can be built, where uh, 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 interests can be seen to be convergent, where the uh, people th themselves can uh, constitute the communities so that it, 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 it binds communities together. And, you know, I, I think of my own uh, life. Um, uh, and so those, that's why looking at the photographs and I probably should have had PowerPoints and photographs that would have made this more interesting, but looking at the photographs that, uh, earlier, I can't help but think that that uh, having access to the woods as I did when I was growing up uh, uh, made me understand both the ways in which uh, everything is related one to the other, but it created in me a sense of responsibility for the the maintenance of uh, of those uh, of those natural uh, features. Now, I, I grew up in in Southern California where um, the reality is uh, a place like LA is, is incredibly park poor. Thankfully, I grew up outside of LA where I, I had access to the foothills and I spent a lot of my youth walking uh, trails and hiking up the draws and following the creeks uh, up to the, uh, the, uh, the, the mountains. Uh, and then a lot of time spent uh, at the beach. So that the, but, I think, and I, if you look at, at, at the, the research, I think it confirms it. I think that a lot of the uh, ideas that I have about my place in the world were constituted by uh, recognizing that I have a place in nature as well. So that the preservation of, of uh, open space contributes to a kind of a perspective building and not just visual perspective building, but a sense of, of your membership in a community that is committed to things that are uh, broadly uh, uh, beneficial. So it doesn't, they're not things that, are, that, that benefit uh, individual persons, but they're individual persons contributing to things that benefit the community as a whole. That to me, uh, and the literature seems to support it, is a, uh, an important civics lesson as well. So when you think about what the land trust does, it, it, what I think it does is to reinforce a lot of the values that I think the environmental justice movement is committed to, which is to uh, one, uh, reduce the impact of uh, uh, our industrial world on uh, human health by uh, improving uh, access to those things that, that actually are beneficial to health. And here it'd be parkland, open space, trees, green spaces. But it also is about recognizing that the community as a whole benefits when you improve these environmental uh, amenities. And that to me is, is to, at the heart of what the environmental justice movement was designed or is designed to do. Now, I don't want to minimize the, the, um, the other things that the environmental justice movement is focused on. And I'll talk a little bit about those here and we'll see whether they can relate back to what the, the land trust is, is doing. But initially the environmental justice movement, as I said, focused on the, the siting of, uh, of uh, um, environmental hazards, basically. Uh, now, uh, when you talk to uh, environmental people in people who are identified as being part of the environmental justice community, uh, you recognize that that it's not an opposition to uh, industrial development. It's an opposition to industrial development where it doesn't belong or where a community is over overloaded. But what it what the environmental justice community is also committed to. And this is, you only learn this by talking to people. And, and one of the things I did uh, at the Department of Justice before I worked on the executive order 
was to bring in people who were involved in environmental justice movement from around the country and just sit down and talk to them and listen to, to their views. Because a lot of the things that they identified as, uh, um, as uh, environmental justice issues wouldn't typically be thought of as, uh, um, as strictly environmental issues. So things like uh, uh, public health issues that were not directly related to a particular environmental uh, 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 or, or industrial feature, for example, uh, those kinds of issues, it seemed to me, related directly to the access to the, uh, the kinds of amenities that would reduce the uh, public health stress on, on these communities. But they were also related to participation. And one of the things that the environmental justice community desires, at least the people I talk to, right, is a sense that they have a stake in uh, building the community that uh, they want to live in. So that the, the values seems to me that the, the land trust uh, uh, represents. And, and uh, you know, I was uh, a member of the Nature Conservancy for many years because my own view, I think, is probably parallel with many of yours, which is, which is you know, you can uh, improve the environment by saving land, right? But the environmental justice community is as concerned with environmental protection as it is with uh, um, reducing perceived injustices. So let me give you one other thing. The, 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 the uh, mention of the reservoir is, it goes directly to this point because one of the things that, that the environmental justice community is uh, concerned about right, is the, are the, the various pathways by which people are, are uh, subjected to environmental insults. And one of them of course is, is water. The, the 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 one that was in the headlines, of course, was was Flint, but that's a, a different issue. But the importance of maintaining green space in order to preserve the quality of water is actually uh, something that benefits not just the community, although it may benefit the community that has a, a lovely reservoir and beautiful uh, beautiful sight lines, right? But it also preserves the it contributes to the health of those people who depend on uh, those water sources. So uh, an example from uh, our sister state, New York, right, is, is, uh, is uh, on point. Uh, New York City, I think to this day, still has the best water of any major city uh, in the United States. And wh why does it, which of course benefits everybody in, in New York City, not just uh, uh, the people who can afford water, everybody who drinks water in, in New York City benefits by this. And how did it do it? It did it by preserving land in the watershed that prevented the water from being contaminated upstream be, uh, before it got to the city. So that the, the, the land trust by acting in a way that is, uh, preserves the, the land that the water depends on in order for, for filtering and other uh, factors is in fact uh, an important contribution to the general public health. So the point of my, my talk is uh, I could have spent all, to, all hour just talking about the environmental justice movement in all its specifics, and I'd be happy to answer questions uh, uh, that uh, you have along those lines. But uh, what I wanted to, to do was to, to, to try to put it in the context of what the land trust is doing, because I think it's important for uh, the kinds of, of initiatives that you're taking to be viewed as not just contributions to New Canaan, although they are perhaps primarily that, but they're contributions to the, the construction of an environment that actually works for everyone. And at the end of the day, that's what the environmental justice movement is for. It's a suggestion that there are no people that you can sacrifice for environmental quality. There is no land that uh, ought to be sacrificed for, uh, in, uh, for uh, environmental quality, but that every decision that you make that produces potential environmental hazards ought to take into account the impact 
on the uh, health of the communities. And by acting with that in mind, you can still have a robust economy, but the robust economy is one that doesn't push all the, the external burdens onto those communities who don't have uh, uh, the power to resist, but rather recognizes that the, uh, the external uh, uh, harms are those that have to be managed at the front end. I want to uh, uh, also say that, that, that the environmental justice community recognizes that uh, things like uh, open space, things like uh, uh, jobs, things like uh, public transportation are all considered to be part of, of uh, the environment and the environmental uh, justice concerns. The thing I want to, to end on though, is that all of the, the, when you look at all of the issues that are raised by the environmental justice movement, the first one is always let our voice be heard. The second one is let's make sure that the environmental protections that we put in place actually work for everyone. One of the things that land protection does is it produces positive uh, benefits that are not captured solely by the community that you're in, but in fact are shared more broadly. And that in itself is a contribution to an environmental quality. And in my view, a contribution to, uh, to making the uh, 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 environmental actions more, more just. So uh, I'll stop there. It's only about 35 minutes, but I wanna leave plenty of time for, for questions. Uh, and I can be a lot more specific if you like, or uh, I can tell you more of the, the work that we're doing um, in, the, uh, in the various uh, uh, groups that, that I, I, I work in. I wanna do two things though, before I close. Uh, one is I wanna, you know, I, we are starting at Yale, a center for environmental justice. Um, and so I, 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 I hope that, that uh, we'll create a, a, internships that uh, perhaps people in the in the, some of the students that you uh, identify here might want to come and, and work in uh, uh, I'm making I'm creating uh, linkages to all of the environmental justice groups in the state and and, and the region uh, and I'm going to create a portal through which all of the work in environmental justice that's being done at Yale can be accessed so it's not just stuff in the, the Yale School of the Environment. There's stuff done in the, in the public health school. There's stuff done in the, in, in the med school. There's, there's things that are being done in the engineering department. There's things done, being done in the political science department. There's things that are done at the law school. I want, I want you to be able to come to the Center for Environmental Justice and get to the place you need to, need, need to, to, to get to. So that's what that's, I'm standing it up, but I'm standing it up slowly. I want to make sure I do it right. I'm hoping by by this time next year it'll be uh, fully pledged, uh, and and uh, um, I hope we won't have to have a virtual opening, but maybe we can have a, a real opening. I invite you to. But the other thing I'm doing is is for any of you who are interested, uh, I'm putting on a a uh, an environmental justice conference this weekend. Uh, um, it's, I'll have panelists from five different continents. And one of the things about Zoom, I guess, is that uh, uh, it, it's, it's made it a lot cheaper to bring people from five different continents to, to New Haven. Um, although my friends in New Zealand have to, have to get up at five in the morning to, to participate. So I feel a little bad for that. Uh, but it's, it's gonna focus on uh, the role of justice in, uh, in global environmental policymaking. And so we'll, we, there'll be uh, ambassadors, uh, uh, economists, jurists, uh, activists, uh, people from, uh, from Africa, people from uh, uh, South America, uh, people from New Zealand, as well as the, the United States. Um, uh, Alfred Brunel is gonna be one of the panelists. He's the winner of the Goldman uh, Prize in 2019, which is commonly referred to as the the Environmental Nobel Prize, uh, and he's been working on forest uh, projects um, in Africa. Um, uh, uh, David Cordero in Ecuador is working on, on ways to 
to operationalize the new constitutional uh, guarantees to protect nature. Uh, Catherine Irons from New Zealand is, is uh, actually has an appointment with the government to figure out ways. If, New Zealand recently passed a, um, a statute that gives legal standing to certain uh, natural features, so rivers, forests, mountain ranges. Um, of course, the question is, is just because they have standing, the question is who represents the interest of those? Well, Catherine is, is one of the people who's, who's uh, sorting uh, that out. She's going to be there. Um, Jennifer Haberkamp, uh, Ambassador Haberkamp, I should say, who negotiated the Montreal Protocol uh, will, will be there. Um, it'll, it's all virtual. Um, and we, we split it over two days so that people don't get zoomed out and exhausted. Um, but uh, uh, if you want to find out more, uh, the, uh, the link is uh, globalej.yale.edu, globalej.yale.edu. Uh, I encourage you to come. One of the, the things we're going to do is, um, is we're actually using a different platform. So it, it won't just be like this, me you know, talking at you. Um, uh, they're actually going to be, uh, um, it's a platform that permits people in the audience to, to mingle. So if you, if, if you see somebody who's interested in what you're interested in, you can go over, tap them on, virtually tap them on the shoulder and have a conversation. So uh, it's a chance to meet people from around the world who are, are doing, uh, I think, doing environmental justice in the context of uh, international institutional uh, 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 decision making. So I hope it'll be. I hope it'll be interesting. Um, uh, I was, you know, I would, I would have much preferred it be in person, uh, but it's saving Yale a lot of money. I'll say that it's saving Yale a lot of money by 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 making it virtual. And I hope that uh, some of you come as well. Um, there's a lot to say about environmental justice, and I, I I wanted to put it in the context of the work that you're doing. Uh, but I'll leave it there and I'll be prepared to answer any questions about any topic in environmental justice that you want to uh, ask me. Uh, if I can't answer it, I will tell you I can't answer it. But if I can, I, I, I'll give it my best uh, best shot. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, oh. Professor Torres. Um, oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, I saw, I saw in the chat there's what time is the conference? Um, it starts at, uh, at uh, one o'clock on Saturday and at uh, 10 o'clock on Sunday, and it'll go for about four hours each day. Um, there'll be there's going to be a movie on Saturday that you can you can stream uh, uh, called Mossville uh, when big trees fall. Um, uh, it's an award winning documentary. Um, so that'll be at the end of the day. Um, there will be a chance, as I said, during the course of the conference to to mingle, to uh, get to meet people. Um, uh, and uh, I think it'll be interesting. I mean, the, the, the people, the panelists are, uh, we have a, 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 a justice of the Supreme Court in, in, in Brazil, for instance, who's gonna be a, a panelist, uh, um, who's also a, an internationally known environmentalist. So he'll talk about uh, Brazil and talk about it from the perspective of, of what it looks like from sitting on, a, on the Supreme Court. Um, so I think, I, think it'll be, I think it'll be interesting. I, I encourage anyone who wants to attend to attend. Excellent. And we can be sure to share some of that information on okay. our, our newsletter and social media. So um, yeah, we've got a couple of questions coming in. So first I want to say thank you so much for, for taking the time to be with us, especially in advance of this <laughs> conference. Um, I guess we can, I'd like to start off with one question that kind of relates to uh, the Supreme Court justice that you just mentioned, not specifically, but more of a, a legal matter. Um, so the question is, can you speak to the role that litigation has played as it relates to correcting environmental injustice and the costs involved? Uh, this person is specifically thinking about things like underserved people, uh, corporate caused damage to fisheries or coral reefs, burning the Amazon, et cetera. Oh, I mean that. that okay, this, the, how much time do I have left? Let's see, uh, um, it, that, that's actually a great question. Um, the, the, let me first say this: that the executive order uh, didn't create any substantive law, but but counted on Title VI, uh, which is a, a non-discrimination clause in government contracting, uh, and that has proved to be basically a, a, a non-starter. So the 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 uh, environmental uh, Justice litigation uh, has, uh, has has taken a lot of roles. So the 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 um, the one that that 
uh, you know comes most readily to mind is obviously the the uh, the work in, in Flint uh, and the uh, the uh, the litigation that is essentially uh, uh, cleaned up or is in the process of cleaning up uh, the uh, uh, the waters uh, for the the uh, people uh, of Flint. But the, the Penobscot, we, the, we, there's litigation around the Penobscot River in in Maine. Uh, it was a it was a, a paper mill town. The the mills, in fact, polluted uh, a lot of the river. It affected the fisheries, so that the fishermen and and some of the the shell fishermen uh, uh, who depended on that for their their livelihood uh, were were essentially put out of business. Uh, and so uh, the litigation, in fact, got some compensation uh, for them. The uh, the um, cap and trade program in California which would reduce uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but it would concentrate emissions in some, uh, in some neighborhoods. The environmental justice litigation led the state of California to restructure where some of the funds would go to improve the, the neighborhoods that are gonna be subject to uh, perhaps uh, uh, more intense uh, uh, concentration of, of some, some uh, pollutants. Uh, for tribes, the a lot of treaty litigation uh, has created, uh, is, it, and this is primarily in the Pacific Northwest, has created uh, causes of action for tribes to uh, intervene to pr uh, protect uh, salmon habitat uh, and shellfish habitat. So, so I mean, that's just a, a, a brief sampling. A lot of there's been a lot of litigation around permitting. So where where a permit has to be granted uh, before a something can be built or something can be located, a pipeline, for example, uh, uh, the litigation has, uh, to a certain extent, uh, been used to do that. Um, there's a litigation that is uh, that that uh, maps the the litigation in uh, in uh, um, Flint uh, that's being. Uh, um, uh, litigated not right now in Camden, New, New Jersey. Um, so litigation has actually been a very useful tool, but it's a difficult tool because there's no clear uh, uh, statute that permits uh, environmental justice issues as such to be litigated. So that means you've got to take the environmental statutes and use them uh, in a way that captures the injuries that uh, the environmental justice movement complains about. Now, as to international uh, issues, uh, um, uh, Antonio, who, um, Antonio Benjamin, who's the justice from, from the Brazilian uh, court, uh, uh, if, you, I mean, what, if, you, if you were to visit Brazil with him, the first thing you do is you take you to Manaus, which is you know, 2,000 miles up, the, uh, you know, up the, the Amazon and still an ocean going port. So it's, uh, that, Tells you how big the Amazon is, right? It's, it's actually uh, it defies just imagination, I think. Uh, but he, the the there has been an effort to create uh, legal regimes that that uh, limit the uh, the both the rate and the kind of, of deforestation. Um, it hasn't been that effective. It hasn't been that effective primarily because. Uh, where you don't have a government that's interested in actually enforcing the prohibitions, uh, you know, it's, the people can't do it themselves, uh, put it quite simply. Uh, there's also some uh, um, uh, dam building uh, um, that's going on in the Amazon that's in fact flooding uh, some major regions of, of, of the Amazon. Um, uh, one of which uh, collapsed recently, uh, but none of this really makes American news, unfortunately, uh, and devastated parts of the, of the forest. And I say that though, um, recognizing that 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 we have to be creative in some ways, because you know when 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 I've spoken to some of my Brazilian friends who are maybe not as environmentally, uh, I don't want to say concerned, but. Uh, Maybe not uh, where environmentalism isn't at the top of their of, of their mind, right? But the, the, what they say to me is, "Look, you guys got to have the 19th century, right? The 19th century in the United States is when 
we basically converted our natural resources into the capital that we now use, right? It was, it was, it, it's when we, we uh, um, mined our, uh, uh, the, the West, right? The, uh, the uh, cut down our forests. Uh, I mean, a statistic I like to, to, to quote people because I used to live in Minnesota is enough wood was taken out of Minnesota to build an eight foot thick hardwood floor over the entire state of Iowa. Right, so that's that's a lot of wood, right? And so so they say, you know, you had the nineteenth century to 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 accumulate that capital. The the Amazon is in fact like a capital store for us. If we can't convert it to the, uh, the capital in the way that you did, then what uh, techniques, what uh, what institutions are you going to help us construct to uh, replace that? And I think that's where you know creative thinking, uh, people who do finance uh, need to be involved in this. So in 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 in, in Ecuador, right, we had a plan uh, to using a land trust basically to purchase land in exchange for the the oil reserves and to keep the oil in the ground, right? So the the oil companies would basically be paid not to not to to drill the oil. Um, you got to raise that money, though, and you have to have have techniques to to uh, to finance that. And then you have a lot of indigenous claims too, which I'd be happy to talk about, but raise a different set of uh, set of issues. Thank you. Um, moving sort of back towards the land trust direction a little bit, uh, we have two somewhat related questions here. Um, the first is, what concerns me is that many of the land trusts, and this is I think referring to sort of the United States, um, exist in places that are not easily accessible to poor or less fortunate communities. Uh, this person is saying they're thinking specifically of Bridgeport, which has a very high asthma rate. Um, how can we create more open space for our less fortunate neighbors? And then we have a second sort of related question coming from um, actually a student of yours at Yale who grew up in New Canaan, saying that they're wondering if environmental justice pro uh, provides best practices for how our town being New Canaan uh, might situate the land trust within the broader context of Connecticut and address, in, address inequalities across town lines. You'll have to give me that person's name. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, one of, what, you know, one of the difficulties um, is, uh, and, and this is important, right? It, 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 because a lot of people want to think, you know, go to the federal level or the state level, but in fact, there's a lot of local decision making that's really critical. Um, I mentioned in passing, right, that public transportation is actually an environmental justice issue. The the uh, the construction of internships, for example, to uh, like the kind that you were discussing in the uh, in, in in your the business part of of your meeting, right. Uh, to reach out to some of the the kids from Bridgeport, it's not going to it's not going to be uh, the solution for the the lack of green space in in Bridgeport, but it will it'll do a couple things. One, it will build a link that one would hope could be longitudinal, but it also would contribute to the their well being. Right. The second thing you can do is you, is is we can uh, uh, think about how city planning has to take the provision of, of green space into account. And it's got to reward those people who, who preserve green space uh, and, and not penalize them. Uh, so that, that, that uh, a place like, I, I haven't, I've, I've conceded, I've only been in Connecticut since January, even though I did go to school here years ago. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I haven't learned as much about the communities, except that I know that the, the local government is a little funny in, in Connecticut. Um, uh, but I'd like to learn more to figure out exactly how you would answer that question relating to, to Bridgeport, right? Take LA. LA, as I said, is, is, is park poor. Well, a friend of mine who recently passed away, what he, he started an organization to re-green the LA River. By re-greening the LA River, it's actually gonna create green space in those communities that traditionally don't have any, right? It'll also, of course, increase the value. So then you have gentrification, that's a problem, but that's, that's down the road. But there, the, the, one of the things is, is, is I think you, 
you need to think broadly and you need to think about ways in which you encourage landowners and city planners to build in green space, not as, as just a, a, an amenity, right? To think of it as a plus, right? As something that, that you want to have, but think of something that's critical to the well-being of the community and, and, and not to, to give it kind of second tier value. Um, and I think, so it, that means you've got to study city planning. That means you've got to study uh, 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 public finance. Uh, I mean, one of the things I love to tell my students is, you know, th there, you know, there are many paths to Rome. Right, and and it, 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 one of the things you have to realize is that, is that you, you you've got to study tax policy, you've got to study uh, state and local government, you've got to study land use planning, you have to study public finance and private finance, and all of these things are going to be all of these are tools that you can use to accomplish the goal. The goal doesn't change, but the tools that you reach down to to work with are important, and the more tools you have, the better advocate, the better uh, you're you're going to be. And so, you know, I'm not sure what all the tools are, say, to, to address the issues in, in, in Bridgeport. And it may be that, that, uh, that uh, it's a, it, it will take a regional approach as opposed to one that, that's localized. But, you know, the, the, the idea of, of some, you know, some internships, you know, look, I was an exchange student to Japan when I was in high school. You know, I'm, I'm a working class kid. My dad's a steel worker. Right, going to Japan, I think changed my life. Right now, I'm not suggesting New Canaan is Japan in relationship to to Bridgeport, but it might be just foreign enough. Thank you. I also think it's worth mentioning. You had sort of hinted at how Connecticut government is a little weird. Um, I think Connecticut land trusts are also a bit weird in the sense that many other states have regional or statewide land trusts, and Connecticut's one of the few places that probably due to the sort of the, the government structure, we kind of, every town has its own land trust. And so I, I think there is room for collaboration between land trusts or um, either more sophisticated partnerships or mergers or things like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a different place to work surely than, than the rest of the country. And I think um, we shouldn't use that as an excuse, but use it as a, as a way to, to try to bridge some of those gaps and, and serve different communities. Well, you can also start to, I mean, what, what, what you just said suggests that there, you need to think about what conversations should we be having, right? And start to plan them. They're not going to happen unless you plan them, unless you do them, right? Um, uh, um, and so you figure out what conversations should we be having to accomplish the goal of preserving the most open space we can and the open space that we've identified as being critical, because that's a, an important thing uh, as well, yeah. So I don't know if there are any more questions. Um, yeah, I, I was actually jotting down a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're still welcome to type in questions, but I'll, in, in lieu of that, uh, ask one here. Um, you had mentioned that open space is sort of uh, are, are common places where communities can interact and sort of uh, come together and have shared experiences or it increases civic engagement, things like that. Um, one of the things I think about a lot with the Lanchers is sort of who our community is. And I think this ties back to the question that we were just discussing is sort of there's sort of the core group of friends of the land trust and then maybe a larger group of um, environmentally conscious people who like what we're doing and come to occasional events. Um, do you have examples of or ways we can think about how we really reach a, a much broader audience so that when we talk about the New Canaan community, we really are talking about the entire town, not just the, the friends of the land trust or the environmental focused members of our community? I, I, I hesitate to answer that because I don't know all of the, the details of New Canaan as well as I should. Um, so I hesitate, but, but the, there's work out there. A student of mine is actually uh, um, doing work on uh, parks in New York City and ways to, to, um, to define the community that the parks serve in a way that, that makes them more, more community building. If you go back to, to uh, Fred, Frederick Law Olmsted, like, if you read his work, right, you can visit Central Park and, and see his work, but if you read the idea that animated it, right, his idea was that, that open space and outdoor spaces are places where you can construct the rudiments of democracy. So, so just like that last question is, you know, should you be having conversations with other land trusts? You, 
you ought to, and, and with a thought in mind is how do we maximize the, uh, 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 how do we maximize the, the, the benefit that we're providing? Now, I saw there's something in the chat about the, the park space in Bridgeport. Uh, uh, twice as many, um, ah, see, I didn't even know that about Bridgeport. So that's something I need to know. So one of the one of the, the the questions one of the questions I would have after seeing that is how are the parks used, right? What are what are, uh, how are the 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 the, uh, the parks maintained? What is the uh, accessibility of them? Uh, I didn't realize it was known as the Park City, but I've just learned in, something. In in the research that you've done, do you find a distinction between parks and open space in terms of some of the the health benefits or social benefits um, from a community? I, uh, I'm specifically interested because a few years ago we had, um, uh, I believe it was a vice president at the Trust for Public Land come to our annual meeting. And one of the TPL's big sort of uh, messages is that they, they want everybody to be within a 10 minute walk of a park. And so they do a lot of urban parks as well as things like partnering with us to acquire the Silvermont Fowler property, which is more of a woodlands. Um, so how is, is there a distinction between those two in the literature and some of the benefits that come from those? Yeah, the, the the believe it or not, though the place I've seen it in the literature is not leisure studies, but but um, uh, uh, kind of reduction of violence in cities. So that 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 you have to have a combination of places where people can just be basically be in nature, right? Because that produces a, a actual psychological effect. But you also have to have places where kids can play, right? And it helps if you have organized activities for kids to play. And so it's the combination of, of the investment in, in kids by having a place where they can do organized sports, even if they're just pickup sports that are relatively loosely organized, that actually reduces uh, violence. And I've worked with people, uh, I continue to work with people in LA who uh, have in fact worked with the police to promote this kind of park use because they know it makes their job easier. Um, so I think there, there is, that exists in the literature um, you know, there's a there's a funny thing in some of the literature that 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 uh, uh, that I have a student who's doing a she's actually going to do her her, her her PhD thesis on it. Uh, some of the literature suggests that 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 the racial disparities in the way that leisure activities are uh, uh, used um, aren't really supported by the. Uh, by the sci social science research, right? So they're 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 like received wisdom that gets repeated in the literature and then factored into the uh, the the planning, but it isn't actually supported. So I'll be interested to see uh, see her work when, when it's when it's done. I think we've got time for for one more question here. Um, I'm going to rephrase it a little, and without making this too political, um, what are some things that the the Biden administration um, can can do to maybe promote some of the issues that we've talked about today, or, or lead to a more environmentally just future? Um, any specific policies or changes in policies that that might might make a big impact from the beginning. Well, a, a, a couple of things. One is to is to, uh, uh, to um, I mean, he, here this is just procedural right at the beginning, which is to re reanimate the uh, National Environmental Justice uh, um, Advisory Committee. For instance, I was invited to to give a talk to the EPA about environmental justice, and it was canceled back in October. Right, so they said, "No, you can't. You can't come and talk about that." Well, first thing we can do is we can start talking about it again. Um, I will tell you, and I will, because I'm working on it now, I'll send you a blog blog post on Monday, right, that answers the question in more detail than I'm going to answer it now, because Biden actually has a, in his platform uh, and some of the documents that the campaign has produced uh, suggested um, things like uh, uh, um, uh, more equitable enforcement of environmental uh, statutes in order to promote uh, environmental justice. But uh, he's got a, a number of other uh, uh, other proposals as well. So I don't know if there's a single thing. Although I did ask my students today, I did ask my students today. I said, okay, I want you to to, to tell me what single thing the Biden Harris administration can do 
to help achieve environmental justice. So when I get their answers, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, thank you so much again for joining us. Well, thank I, you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I wish it could have been in person, but, but, but this was fun. Thank you. I hope, I hope other people had fun. I did, so. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll be sure to follow up with some of that information about the, um, uh, the upcoming uh, okay. conference and be sure to get that out to our members. And Perfect. With that, I'll, I'll turn it over back to Tom again for a few closing words. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And, and thank you, Professor Torres. Your, your thoughts and, and comments were so insightful and we all appreciate how you put them in the context of what we're doing here at the New Canaan Land Trust. Very much appreciate that. Thank you, it's my, uh, my pleasure. You really put it perfectly when you said, any way you cut it, making access to open space produces positive benefits. Uh, that's a perfect final thought uh, to end on. So with that, I'd like to uh, adjourn tonight's meeting. I'd like to thank everybody in attendance for being part of this organization. We wanna thank you all for your contribution to our success. We want to thank you for your continued support and please uh, stay healthy and we are looking forward to seeing you out on a land trust property soon. Good night everybody. Good night. Professor Torres. Good night. You might see me out at New Canaan, I'm telling you what. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. All right. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>